So here's a problem from the 2008 AP Calc AB and BC exams. It's a problem that deals with velocity. So we're told that a particle is moving along the x-axis. The velocity function on the interval 0 to 6 is given by this graph down here. So uh, it's always defined, right? No undefined velocity is pretty, pretty straightforward looking velocity graph there. Uh, velocity is 0 at zero makes sense three yep and five yeah and horizontal tangents on this velocity graph at one yeah it looks like that and four the areas of the regions bounded by the t-axis in this graph from zero to three we have an area of eight square units from three to five we have this area right here being three square units and then on the interval from five to six, we have this space down here being two square units. We're told that the initial position of the particle is negative two, and that happens at time zero. Uh, part A, find both the time and the position of the particle when the particle is farthest to the left, justify your answer. So what this triggered for me was that if I'm looking for when the particle is farthest to the left, and I'm considering its x-coordinate, x is going to be farthest to the left when x is at a minimum, when it's most negative. So I've tried to minimize the x value or minimize the position function x of t. So anytime you're looking for an absolute max, or in this case an absolute min, uh, you have some candidates to consider. The candidates would be places where your uh, interval ends, so 0 and 6 are already specified as endpoints, so the max might, or excuse me, the min is what we're looking for here. Might happen at 0, might happen at 6. Also places where that function that you're trying to minimize has critical numbers. So what you have to be careful of here is that you're given a velocity graph. Velocity is actually the derivative of what we're trying to minimize. We're trying to minimize position. So I would need to know when the derivative of position is equal to 0. Well, this is the derivative of position. This graph is equal to 0 at 3 and at 5. Uh, it's also equal to 0 at 0, but I've already got that list as a candidate, so I didn't really need to worry about it again. So at this point, what I was doing is I was just going to go ahead and try to figure out what my position was, my x-coordinate was, at each of these times. So I know what it is at 0. It's negative 2. They told us that at the end of the problem statement. At time 3, if I'm looking for position, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to take into account the starting position at time 0, and I'm going to have to add on how much the position changed by on the interval from 0 to 3 by integrating that rate of change. So if I think about how I'm going to compute this integral right here, that's why they gave us these areas. On the interval from 0 to 3, we're told that this amount of space down here is 8 square units in area. So since a definite integral is a signed area, if you're considering it graphically, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take that starting value and we're going to add on, not 8, 8 would be the total distance that the particle traveled from 0 to 3, uh, but because the distance is traveled in the negative direction as indicated by the negative velocity that you see on this graph, we're going to end up having to subtract that off or add the negative is how I represented it. And your position at time 3 is negative 10. So the position was negative 2, the position decreased by 8 units on the interval 0 to 3, we end up at this value of x at time 3. So at time 5, my next candidate, I know I'm at negative 10 at time 3, so I'm starting there and I'm adding on how much my position changes by, by integrating the rate of change of position from 3 to 5. Now from 3 to 5, I do have a positive amount of change. My position would be increasing as indicated by the positive velocity on this stretch of the graph. And so I'm adding 3 onto the position at time 3 to get my position at time 5, which ends up giving me negative 7. And then one more calculation at time 6. I want to know the position there. I know at time 5 I'm here, so I'm starting at negative 7. I'm adding on how much position changes by by integrating the rate of change of position from 5 to 6. Uh, I have a negative velocity, so I have the position decreasing there. This space is below the x-axis or the t-axis, so I know I'm going to have to subtract that off within the integral. So I added on the negative again and adding that onto the negative 7 leaves us with a position at 6 of negative 9. So conclusion, most 
negative value we saw, object farthest to the left, happens at time 3, and the position happens to be negative 10. Part B here is kind of tricky. Obviously, you see a lot of writing that I did to, to satisfy the requirements for Part B here. It says, for how many values of t from 0 to 6 is the particle going to be at the x-coordinate of negative 8? Explain your reasoning. Before we get any further into what's on this screen, I want to go back to part A real fast. So the question is, how many times is the particle at negative 8? We know the particle started here, and then by time 3, the particle was here. By time 5, the particle was here. By time 6, the particle was here. So I'm going to have to cross negative 8 once to get from here to here. I'm going to have to cross negative 8 a second time to get from this x to this x. And I'm going to have to cross negative 8 a third time to get from this x to this x. So the answer is not that difficult as long as you have these calculations done properly from part A. Uh, but making sure you satisfy this explain your reasoning part of the problem is, is kind of kind of delicate. So that's really why I have all of the wording that's going on here. So I started by saying that my velocity function is defined everywhere, right? This is a velocity graph. I don't have any holes or asymptotes on this velocity graph. And what that tells me is that my position function is differentiable, right? This is the derivative of position. And if this derivative is always defined. My position function is differentiable. And really why I needed to recognize that is because if my position function is differentiable, it's got to be continuous. So I am going to be guaranteed to have a position that is some finite x value at every single time between 0 and 6. One other thing that we have to make sure we recognize is that the particle only changes directions at time 3 and at time 5. Uh, I have a negative velocity, negative velocity, negative velocity, negative velocity. So from 0 to 3, the object's moving to the left. From 3 to 5, the object's moving to the right. And then from 5 to 6, the object's moving to the left. So the only times the particle changes position, are, or excuse me, changes directions, are at these two times. So I know that because of the argument that we made when we went back here and looked at part A, that from time 0 to time 3, the object gets from this x-coordinate to this x-coordinate. The object has to cross the x-coordinate of 8 to get from here to here. Well, what from calculus backs that up? Uh, that's the intermediate value theorem. So I paused the video a minute ago because I realized that this was wrong. This should have been x of 0 is equal to negative 2, and x of 3 is equal to negative 10. Right? Those are the x-coordinates of the object at time 0 and time 3. The intermediate value theorem, because of the continuity of the function, there's no way to get from this position to this position without crossing the position of negative 8 one time in between. We know it's only one time because the object is only moving to the left from 0 to 3. Uh, using that same logic, the intermediate value theorem, x is going to equal negative 8 again sometime between 3 and 5. The object is moving to the right from 3 to 5. And for some reason, when I wrote this up, I kept on indicating velocity values here, but these should definitely be uh, x-coordinates. So the x-coordinate of the object at time 3 is negative 10. That's one of those results from part A. The x-coordinate of the object at time 5 is negative 7, another result from part A. I have to cross negative 8 one time in between time 3 and time 5 to get from this position to this position. And then similarly, uh, specifying the same conclusion for the interval from 5 to 6. And again, I for some reason was stuck on recognizing velocity values when I wrote this up. Uh, but those are definitely position values. So all those red x's are x-coordinates, not velocity values at those times. Uh, but in the end, by the intermediate value theorem applied to three separate intervals, we have to equal negative 8 with our x-coordinate three times from 0 to 6. Part C, a little more straightforward. On the interval from 2 to 3, speed of the particle increasing or decreasing, give a reason for your answer. So the easiest way to define speed for calculus purposes, and you probably do this in physics as well, is to define it as the magnitude of velocity or just the absolute value of velocity if your motion is only happening in one direction. So speed is the absolute value of velocity. Uh, so I basically look at my velocity graph on the interval from 2 to 3, and I see that my velocity graph is moving towards 0. If my velocity graph is moving towards 0, 
the absolute value of velocity is getting smaller and thus speed is decreasing. So the, the explain the reasoning portion of this can be satisfied by saying since velocity is approaching zero, that is due to a negative velocity and a positive acceleration on the interval from two to three. Therefore, speed is decreasing. Uh, part D, during what intervals, if any, is the acceleration of the particle negative? Justify your answer. Again, something else that's pretty straightforward. You have to realize right away that this is a velocity graph and acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So when you're looking at a graph and you're trying to determine values of that graph's derivative, you're always going to look at slopes. So acceleration values are going to be indicated by the slope of the graph of v of t. So if we're trying to figure out where acceleration is negative, we're going to be looking for where the slope of this graph is negative. So since the slope of this graph in v is decreasing on the interval from 0 to 1, and we know it ends at 1 because it told us up here in the problem statement that we went through way back in part A that we had a horizontal tangent at 1. So we have negative, 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 negative slope until we get to 0 at 1. We are looking at negative accelerations between 0 and 1 because of that. Uh, we're looking at positive accelerations, positive slopes between 1 and this next horizontal tangent, which happens at 4. And then from 4 to 6, we're back to negatively sloped tangents. We're back to a decreasing velocity. Therefore, we are back to a negative acceleration.